evening. Thanks for coming by. Um, welcome to Peak Design. We've been here since 2017. Um, we make rad gear. We primarily focus in camera accessories and carries. So if you got shit, we make probably make something to carry it. Bags, mobile accessories, camera straps, and that kind of thing. Um, every month we try to have a featured artist for our community. <laughs> uh, this month we have my man Phil here. Phil just kind of like randomly came in one day. And was like, I really love the brand. And I was like, yeah, let, let's get you hooked up. <laughs> I think one month later we got Phil like a bunch of gear and he was just kind of over the moon about it and you know we stayed in contact and I eventually, he eventually shared his work with me and I was like, oh my god, we have to get you in the store. So. We got him in the store, and now we have him have his lovely presentation on Astro. Um, we found a lot of folks really like workshops, so hopefully you'll learn something or two from my man Phil here. And I'll take it over. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. I was going to shout out Alex. He's the reason that Peak Design hooked me up and gave me this slot tonight. I'm very, very grateful for this opportunity. I've never given a talk, I think period. I was going to say about photography. I don't know that I've given a talk ever. Uh, <laughs> so anytime you have a question, this is not formal. Just put your hand up, interrupt, and I'll try my best to answer it. I'm not an expert, I'm just some kid that really likes to take photos. Uh, and I'm gonna do my best to show you guys just the very basic intro to astrophotography tonight. Uh, astro is kind of the reason I got into photography. I saw that people online were posting these crazy photos of the night sky and I was like, I wanna do that. I stole my mom's camera and I haven't looked back since. It's what keeps me coming back to photography every time I put it down for a while. Astro was, is what gets me back in there. Um, it's really cool to be able to see a part of the world that our eyes aren't always capable of seeing. It's there, and if you have incredible eyesight, you might see some of this stuff with the naked eye, but it all actually exists, and you can use all sorts of tools going from smartphones to telescopes to try and get some of it and capture the memories. So, I'm gonna do my best to meet the needs of every different skill level and camera equipment that you guys have today. Don't be afraid to interrupt. Please ask as many questions as you can. I'll be asking you guys questions too. Um, okay, so if you want a cheat sheet and you just got to dip to a Halloween party real quick, these are the answers. You can take a pic of this. I'm going to put this on. No, genuinely, this is like, this is basically what we're going to cover. And if you already know all this stuff, you could just take a pic of this and, and run off and you'll probably be fine next time you want to take some astro shots. Um, but what is the first thing that you need to think about when you want to go out and do some nighttime photography? What's, let's get some hands going here. No idea is a bad idea. What would you want to look for? What are you maybe like, oh, I want to go take nighttime photos. I should check. The weather, that's, I, this was not scripted. Oh, wait, this was not scripted. <laughs> the weather, if there's clouds, you're not gonna be able to see the stars. So just start by checking your local weather forecast wherever you are. San Francisco tends to be foggy, but there's plenty of places in California that are nice and dry, you can go there. Second thing you would check. Now let's say you've got clear skies, that's all covered. What are you gonna be looking for? The moon. That's a good answer. We're gonna get to that, that's next in the slides. One other thing you might want to consider for nighttime specifically, you're trying to get dark skies. Light pollution, exactly. So there are a bunch of great websites. This is one of them. This is Dark Sight Finder. It's basically a map of light pollution at night. And so you can use it to look at where you live. This is the bay, where it's red. <laughs> it's not ideal initially, right? You, you might look at this where there's red, there's like a lot of light pollution. You might be like, E, that's not for me, like I probably can't take photos here. It's very direction dependent. So if you go to like Half Moon Bay or uh, Russian Ridge or that area and you face away from the red when you're taking photos, you might actually be able to get some pretty dark shots. But in California, we're also really lucky to have a bunch of areas like in you. This is Yosemite right here. You can see it's a lot darker than the bay. 
And the last thing you're gonna wanna check for though, so now you've got clear skies, you've got dark skies. The last thing to keep in mind is also gonna be the moon. Like our friend in the front here said, the moon is reflecting the sun's light. And when it's full, it's almost impossible to get shots of the stars. When the sky is darkest, you, the stars pop out a lot more. You get a lot more contrast in the sky. But when the moon is full, the sky is quite blue. This is an example uh, of a shot when the moon is half full. You can already see that the sky is almost like daytime blue. That's because it's the light being reflected from the sun. So it's the same kind of color temperature light. You could use websites like this to look at like how full the moon is. This is today. It's at 25% and it's waning, so it's getting smaller. We're going towards a new moon. Um, but yeah, so you can usually aim for windows when the moon is smallest. You can also check things like the moon rise and moon set times. Tonight, the moon might not rise until 3 a.m. So until 3 a.m., you've got really, really dark skies. Um, okay, so this is a comparison of a shot when the moon is out and it's still quite bright in the sky. And this is when it's a lot darker. Uh, does anyone want to guess what we're seeing in this image just before we move on to like the basics and stuff? What's that blue stuff? Anyone? Algae? Yeah, yeah, it's some bioluminescent phytoplankton. It's a form of algae. And every scientist still don't know exactly why they emit light. We're like, we, we know the, the chemical mechanism, but we don't know what the purpose is. But every time something moves through, if you've been lucky enough to go swimming in that stuff, your arms like light up when you're swimming in that. So super cool. Um, but okay, let's get down to the basics. I want to get a show of hands. Who knows what shutter speed is? Okay, wow, decently photographically inclined crowd tonight. Uh, who knows what aperture is? Also, okay, okay, okay. ISO, anyone? Yeah, okay, oh wow, okay, we're not starting from nothing. Um, okay, let's start with shutter speed. Who raised their hand for shutter speed? <laughs> you did. <laughs> Give me the rundown. What's shutter speed, super simply put? How fast the shutter closes. Yes. So shutter speed is all to do with how long you are capturing light for. You can capture super quickly. You can have something as short as one one thousandth of a second, one ten thousandth of a second with some modern cameras. When you're doing astrophotography, you want to maximize the amount of light that's coming into the camera. It's usually, it's a lot darker than this room is right now. It's a hell of a lot darker than daytime. So you want to bring in as much light as you can. So what do you think you would do with your shutter speed alley? You can make it slower. That's correct. You're going to expose for a longer amount of time. If you expose for one second, you're letting 100 times more light come in than at 1 100th. And that seems pretty logical, but it's one of those things that when you use cameras in the day to day, you don't think about it. You just, you know, on your iPhone, you just click and it does it for you. When you control the shutter speed, you can control how much light is coming in over the duration of time. OK. Uh, when you are doing astrophotography, you want to have a longer shutter speed. You're going to have things on the order of like 5, 10, 15, 20, sometimes 30 seconds, sometimes multiple minutes. But what you'll start to notice is that you might start to get star trails. Now, star trails happen because the Earth is rotating. It's actually not flat. Crazy, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Crazy thing. Um, and star trails can sometimes be used to like an artistic effect. There's one photo here, this one, if you look at it after, has like long star trails intentionally. Kind of shows the rotation of the Earth. But oftentimes when people go out to take star photography, they're kind of aiming for what's on the left. They want like little pinpoints. And there's a very simple rule to follow to know how long you can expose for before those trails start appearing. Who knows what your focal length is? Just, I won't pick on you, I promise. <laughs> You're one person focal length? Okay, focal length is like how zoomed in you are. And the more zoomed in you are, the shorter your maximum exposure time can be before you start to get star trails. So if you have a really wide lens, you can expose for a really long time before those trails appear. And if you have a very zoomed in lens, you can't expose for very long. There's a simple rule that you can look up if you're ever actually like out there and like getting a bit more serious. It's called the 500 rule. You just take your focal length and use it to divide 500. So if I have a 50 millimeter lens, very common, I divide 500 by 50, gives me 10 seconds. That's roughly how long I can expose for on a 50 millimeter lens. 
before those trails start to appear. If I have a 10 millimeter lens, divide 500 by 10, I can expose for 50 seconds. A 10 millimeter lens, by the way, is super, super wide. And a 50 millimeter lens is kind of like standard narrow. It's like when you do telephoto mode once on your iPhone. <laughs> I feel like that's something people might be familiar with. Okay, so shutter speed, we've kind of covered. You want to expose for a longer amount of time. But if you go too long, you might start to see the trails. And so if you do, just make it a little bit shorter. The next thing you can control to change the amount of light coming in is the aperture. Now, we had a bunch of hands go up for aperture. I'm going to pick on Danielle right there. Danielle, can you give us a brief overview? What is aperture? Simply put. exactly right. Gold star for Danielle, 10 <laughs> points. Um, I have a prop here that you can pass around. This is an old lens. There's two pins on the front, just twist them and you'll be able to see what ap aperture blades are actually doing. So if you look in, there's aperture blades. I'll just do it for the front row and then you guys can, I'll pass it to you and if you just want to pass it around. Uh, so aperture is one that Everyone knows the word, no one knows what it means. It just means the opening of the lens. <laughs> and so the more open your lens is, the more light is gonna come in. People are often afraid to shoot at larger apertures because they know, if they know something, that like aperture is what can give you those blurry backgrounds. That's not that much of an issue with star photography because you're already focused on the background. You're focused at infinity. So open your aperture up all the way and if you get more into astrophotography, you might get lenses that specifically have very wide apertures. Up here, we've got a bunch of different equipment, and I'll go a bit more into it later. But this is like a very common kind of camera that if you have one or if you, someone in your family has one, probably have something like this with a lens like this on it. Kit lenses are great general purpose, and they usually can open up to a number. I'm going to say number here. It's just F. 3.5 or f4 and that's all fine and dandy but it's not like specialized to let a ton of light in if you want to let more light in you can look for lenses that have smaller aperture numbers i know that's a bit counterintuitive but the smaller the number is the bigger the opening fractions fractions yeah sure so <laughs> so like oftentimes for astrophotography you might look for things that are like f2.8 f2 f1.4 and those numbers seem arbitrary, but the smaller they are, the more light they let in. That's all you need to remember. So whatever camera you have, whether it's an iPhone or like some high-end camera, whatever lens you're using, just make sure you open the aperture all the way by setting the F number as small as it will go. So that's aperture. The last thing uh, is ISO. So ISO I keep for last because you should try and optimize shutter speed and aperture before you like go in and mess with the ISO. ISO is great. It's the boost that the camera applies to the image signal that's coming in. And so when it's really dark, you're naturally going to have to boost the image a little bit more. But if you boost it too much, you get some of this kind of, I don't know if you guys can see on the projection, but this kind of like textured, sandy, blotchy color stuff. You're trying to avoid that. And the best way to avoid that is by gathering as much light as possible with the aperture and the shutter speed, by maxing those out, making the aperture as big open as it can and exposing for as long as you can before the, the trails come in. Once you've optimized those two as much as you can, then you come in, you boost the, aperture, uh, you boost the ISO, and modern cameras often look great even into like 12,800. This diagram is a bit confusing. Ignore the numbers on the top, but you can boost ISO a lot now on modern cameras and still get pretty decent looking stuff. This is what your phone does too. When you try and take images at night, it will expose for a long time, open up the aperture, and it will boost the ISO at the end. Um, okay, gear. We're just going to talk about gear quickly. We could talk about gear for days. We're just going to talk about it very quickly. Nowadays, even modern smartphones can, uh, even what you have in your pocket is probably good enough to get you started. I was just out the other night, managed to get some pretty decent shots on my phone. Better than what you could get on a digital camera like 20 years ago, for sure. Um, if you're a step beyond that, you could think about, you know, if you're wanting to get in a little bit more control over the settings, 
you can look at getting, you know, a camera like this, you could probably find for 100, 150 bucks used. There's tons of them out there. Facebook Marketplace, you can check your local camera store, you can look for used ones. Uh, I've even taken astro shots on this little point and shoot. You can control the settings, and if you can control the settings on a camera, you can usually optimize them to like, get the best astro image that you can with it. Obviously, this isn't gonna be as good as something that has like a much bigger sensor and a much bigger lens that lets in a ton more light, but usually what you have is good enough to get you started. Um, so yeah, sometimes this option is good. If you wanna go a bit beyond a phone, you can get stuff like this anywhere from 100 to like 500. You can be off to a good starting point. You could go more high-end as well. Something like this can set you back like two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000. You're talking about a used car now. Um, <laughs> to give you guys an idea, people that are super serious, NASA, they spent $10 billion on their little Astro setup. That's the James Webb Space, Space Telescope, lets you get shots like that. But like, yeah, the range is anywhere from 100 to $10 billion and probably more in the future too. Um, okay, so quiz time. This is a place where it was super dark. Does anyone know what that might be in the photo? Not quite Joshua Tree, it is a tree. You're on the... <laughs> Does anyone know what the oldest trees in the world are? The oldest species that... Is it a juniper? No. It's kind of like a juniper. They, li they exist in California. So this is in California, high up in the mountains. They live at high altitude. This tree here is 4,000 years old. Yeah, so this is a bristlecone pine, and they only grow up at like super high altitudes, which conveniently usually means dark skies, far away from stuff. Cold temperatures are also good for imaging. We don't need to get into the science of that, but when it's cold outside, your camera likes it. Uh, <laughs> so if I was trying to take a photo like this, which I did, I took this one, what would I do with my aperture Alessandro? A plus, A plus, 10 out of 10, uh, awesome. What would I do with my shutter speed, Cooper? 500 over. <laughs> <laughs> You're too good for school, yeah. Uh, yeah, I would, I would leave it pretty long because this is like a pretty dark scene, right? And so yeah, you're, you're correct, 500 over whatever the focal length is. This case, it was pretty wide, it was a 14. So I was able to expose for 30 seconds if I wanted to. I think I only ended up doing 15, but I could have done it for 30 seconds. Um, and lastly, what would I do with my ISO? Sir, in the front, can I pick on you? Is that all right? What would I do with the ISO in this? Or up or down? Um, well, you don't want to get any noise in the picture, so you're going to adjust it. You want to take a couple of practice shots. He's 100% right. He's 100% right. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, that's, that's correct. You can always adjust when you're on site. Every scene is always gonna be a bit different. Um, and so you, could, you always need to make adjustments depending on what you're shooting to. Like if you're shooting the Milky Way, that's very different than shooting, for example, the Northern Lights. Northern Lights move way faster than the sky rotates. So when you wanna kind of freeze the shape of the Northern Lights, you might actually wait, cut down way down on your exposure time. So instead of being 30 seconds, I think this was only two. I still used a lens that had a big opening, let in a ton of light, and I did have to boost my ISO, but I wanted to capture the shape of the northern lights. Um, so yeah, this is pretty much the basics. We're just gonna go through a few more images, also northern lights, quick exposure time, northern lights here too. Quick flats, no big deal. No, <laughs> well, this is the shot I took this summer with not even, with like a three, $400 lens, and it's my favorite shot I've taken this year. So you don't need to spend like thousands and thousands of dollars on it. Location beats equipment and lenses beat camera and knowledge beats all. So it's kind of like, it's like a scale. <laughs> um, let's see, we could touch very briefly. Images like this are possible with a pretty basic setup too. Remember how we talked about the rotation of the earth giving you star trails. The more zoomed in you are, the quicker those star trails start to appear. But when you want to zoom in on just a small portion of the sky, you have to use a zoom lens that is more zoomed in. So how do you prevent the star trails from happening? There are these awesome devices called 
Uh, equatorial mounts, star trackers, you could buy them for like 200 bucks. And what you do is this thing here sits between your tripod and the camera. Um, and it spins, it spins very slowly. It spins once every 24 hours. What else spins once every 24 hours? <laughs> yes, the earth, that's correct. <laughs> Because it's not flat. <laughs> so what we do with this, you can adjust where it's pointing, and we point it at the North Star. The North Star is always in the same place in the sky because it's aligned with the Earth's axis of rotation. So it's like a top. If you spin around, there is one point that will always be in the same place in your field of vision. That's the North Star for the Earth. And so when you point this at the North Star, and it spins the same way the Earth does, you're able to counteract the motion of the stars and just zoom in on one part of the sky. Then once you do that, you're able to take long exposures when you're zoomed in too, so you can focus on much smaller things. Instead of getting the whole sky, you can look at just a small piece at once. This is the Orion Nebula. As far as I know, if I'm not mistaken, it's the closest, the closest nebula to us. It's like a thousand light years away and it's a thousand light years across. That could be completely wrong. I'll have to fact check that, but <laughs> I think that's what it is. And what you're seeing is ionized gas being excited by electrons and photons from stars. There's stars being born in there. It's magical. This all exists. And like, if you're just out there, you might not know that. But if you use a camera, you can take a closer look. I think that's just so cool. This is the Andromeda galaxy. It's the closest galaxy to our galaxy, which is the Milky Way. And you could get stuff like this, too. I did this with a. $300 lens and that like $300 tracker. You just need patience. You're going to fail a lot, but eventually you'll get there. And on that note, if you've been looking at all these photos thinking like, ah, oh, God, this guy, so annoying with all his nice photos and stuff. I, I started with photos like this, way over edited, very purple. I don't know what I'm doing there. My phone is on the ground. I used to think photos like this were like, oh yeah, this is my best shot ever. Keep at it. It gets better over time, and one day this photo might turn into something more like this. Thank you very much. That's the end of the presentation. Now we go to Q&A. Thank you. Please ask a lot of questions. Yes, Dan, let's go. question Filters, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Filters do a ton of stuff, but they're basically a layer that you can put between your lens and the outside world to change what you're capturing in some way. A very common filter for like daytime use is called a circular polarizer. That lets you cut down on reflections by only allowing light that is polarized in a certain direction to come through. So people use that when they're taking shots of like windows and they want to be able to see through the windows or when they are shooting water and they don't want the reflections of the water to just overwhelm the image. There are specific filters for nighttime photography as well. So there are some filters that, due to their elemental composition of the glass in there, will block out certain wavelengths of light. A lot of the light pollution in cities is caused by sodium vapor lamps, the kind of like street lights that you see that have that orange glow. They're very common around the world. They started around the 1970s. They're very economical. They were like LEDs before there was LEDs. And a lot of the light pollution comes from these lamps, which all emit at the exact same wavelength in the electromagnetic spectrum. <laughs> I didn't know we were going to talk about this now. <laughs> um, so there are filters that will block that exact wavelength. And so if you live in a light polluted area, you can think about getting, they're often called red intensifiers. They're used commonly to like take photos of foliage in the fall, take photos of deciduous trees, maple trees, stuff like that. You get those nice red leaves and they like make it pop a bit more. They're not as common nowadays because that was more in the film days when you had to get everything right just then and there. Now people can edit their photos to be more red. But yeah, you can use those photos and they will actually cut down on the amount of light that isn't from the stars in light polluted areas usually. So that's one of the more common star photography filters for like general purpose stuff like that. People that are really serious about astrophotography will have narrow band filters, which are 
Filters where if you and I were to hold it up right now, it would just look like a piece of black glass. You can't see through it. But it lets just one specific narrow band of light pass through. And they'll have them for red, green, and blue. They'll shoot in black and white and then combine each of those channels back into red, green, and blue. That's actually how like Hubble images, James Webb Space Telescope images, all the very serious stuff is done like that. But yeah, so that's like, does that answer the filter question? Okay, awesome, cool, cool, cool. There's gotta be other questions, yes. Most remote place I've gone. I could pull up a map. Uh, let's see. <laughs> yeah, this is that's a loaded question right there. Uh, okay, it wasn't. I'll answer it the best I can. It wasn't just for a photo. It was for like a bunch of videos, and I was trying to make a documentary. But I once drove to this place here, which if I zoom out slowly, you'll start to see where that is. <laughs> so, yeah, that was when I was still living in Canada, so it was a bit shorter of a drive. It was only like 50 hours as opposed to the, <laughs> the 70 that it would take from here. But, yeah, so that's, that's the furthest north you can drive in Canada. That's Tuktoyuktuk. -tuk. It's a town on the Arctic Ocean. Uh, and they only finally built the final permanent road to have year-round access in 2017. Before that, you could only access it in the winter because then everything was frozen and you could drive on the ice. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's maybe the most remote place I've been. I saw the craziest aurora of my life when I was camping at the Arctic Circle there. Insane. If you ever get the chance to go somewhere that remote, it's wild. We would drive on the road. They call it the highway, the Dempster Highway. It's not a highway. It's a dirt road. There's no, it's not paved. For 750 miles, it's not paved, just dirt. And we would drive on it for like six, seven, eight hours at a time without seeing a single other like car or sign of life. There was one gas station in the middle of the 750 mile strip and it's like a hotel straight out of The Shining. They have like <laughs> all these taxidermied animals. It's crazy. If you ever get the chance to like make the trip, highly recommend. Ah. So yeah, most I would I think that's probably the most remote place I've been for, yeah. But I've been in many places for it. Yeah, what's up? Does removing the higher filter like affect the color matching? Absolutely. So this gentleman just asked a pretty advanced question. But all ca <laughs> <laughs> all cameras have an infrared filter built in at the factory. Reason being, camera sensors capture outside the visible light spectrum as well, just the way they're manufactured. Because camera manufacturers want photos, digital photos, to look like what our eyes see, they put in filters that cut everything that's outside the visible on both ends. If you're serious about astrophotography and you want to get more detail from Nebula, so I'll go back to the, oh, scroll over. Scroll over. I'm not a technologue. We got this. We got it. We're going we're gonna to get there. Uh, okay, wait. If you want to get more detail in Nebula, like what's on the right, a lot of that is outside the visible spectrum, so you can remove on your camera the infrared cut filter, let infrared light back into your camera. But doing that is a pretty permanent thing. Um, and so the colors in daytime photography will definitely be affected. Because there is infrared light all around us, and when your camera captures it too, it shifts the color balance a lot. There are some cameras where you can manually clip an infrared cut filter in and then just clip it out when you want to shoot like that kind of stuff. Yeah. So yes. You're talking about removing the, uh, the infrared, that's the same thing as a modified camera for astrophotography? Absolutely, yeah. So they also have further modifications that they can do. That's the primary one where they remove that infrared cut filter. Some cameras also have cooled sensors. Light is heat and heat is light. So when you have warm temperatures, you get stray photons that come in as, as noise. They're not the light that you want to be getting from the stars. They're just light that's coming in from the heat. So some cameras have cooling systems to cool the sensors down to reduce the amount of like noise and stray photons that are bouncing around on the sensor. 
So yeah, so that's like another modification that some cameras have. Well, they'll have like, yeah. So would that be the same as the camera that you use to attach to your telescope? A lot of the modified cameras are like optimized for use on telescopes because they are like designed for that purpose from the ground up. Um, yeah, so the ones that have cooling systems are usually going to just look kind of like a, like a Coke can with a little fan and they might only shoot in monochrome because they know the people using them are serious and are going to use those red, green, blue cut filters that we talked about. Any other questions? Yes, Lake. So, say you've removed the infrared filter. <laughs> 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 There's got to be less advanced questions out there, but sure, let's say we remove the infrared filter. Yeah. So now your sensor is able to capture the infrared. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. How does it then represent the, the colors when you're compressing it back into the visible light spectrum? <laughs> it just shifts the histogram over and like records infrared as another color bit, like from the sensor readout, if that makes sense. So it just, it just shifts, like when I've shot my modified camera in daytime, a lot of like trees and grass, like anything with chlorophyll reflects infrared light very strongly. So that stuff looks almost like, uh, like orange white, whereas normally it just looks green, if that makes sense, yeah. Okay, non-infrared I want just like <laughs> general ask, yes, okay, we've got someone in the back there. Um, where's your most favorite place to shoot? My most favorite place to shoot? That's a loaded question. You guys, well, let's, let's qualify it a bit more. In the bay, because we're here, uh, I really like going out to, in later Milky Way season, I like going up to the Russian Ridge area. What's Milky Way season? Sorry, Milky Way, <laughs> great question, Alex. Thank you so much. The Milky Way is our galaxy. And it's very prominent in some of these images, like here. What you're seeing here, our galaxy is a disk, right? So why is it showing up as a straight line? We're not in the middle of the disk. We're like on one of the edges. And what you see here is like a cross section of that disk. Think of it like a giant rotating disk. We're just looking directly kind of through it. Almost every star you can see is in our galaxy. It's in the Milky Way. Um, and usually in the northern hemisphere, the Milky Way is visible roughly from like May, sometimes late April, to around this time, late October, early November. That's the time of the year when you can go out with your camera and try to get this kind of like column of dramatic light, which adds some, in my opinion, it's very subjective, but adds some sort of, I don't know, interesting element to the image. Um, so what was the original question? <laughs> favorite place to shoot. Oh, favorite place to shoot. Yeah. Okay, great. Of all time. So of all, t of all time, I mean, yeah, so come far, on. So far in this moment, I guess. Oh, man. In your life. <laughs> uh, I think Yosemite really has it all. I'm not saying that because we're in California, but it's got everything you need. It's got giant sequoias. It's got huge dramatic rock formations. It's got super dark skies. It's pretty dry for a lot of the time. Um, Yosemite is hard to beat. I would say Bryce Canyon, which is, well, can I take yeah, some? Yeah, yeah rip it off the Give, pass this around. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we'll start in the back and then you can pass it around. I'd say Bryce Canyon is also one of my favorite. It has really, really dark skies, really cool rock formations, cool colors, like these candy corn spires. Bryce is definitely up there. There's, sorry? Yeah, they have like the, the, so the rocks in Bryce, I'll pull up some Google images. Uh, yeah, you'll, you'll see what I mean. So this is Bryce Canyon here. This is also, yeah, okay, cool. In daytime, you can see these kind of like, you see what I mean by like candy corn spire has like the multicolored, like, yeah. Um, so yeah, Bryce, is, Bryce and Yosemite are like pretty hard to, to top for me, I'd say. But many recommendations. In the Bay, late season, so like July onwards, Mount Tam is a great option. If you're south of the bridge, there's all Russian Ridge, Pescadero. If it's a clear night, 
There's no light pollution. You're facing towards the Pacific Ocean. There's no one living out there. I mean, no one I know, but yeah. <laughs> Some fisher people. Um, yeah. Other questions? Yes. Okay, all right, we'll, we'll accept the question, yeah. Where uh, should you be focusing, like, I'm assuming you're on manual focus yes. when shooting these. Where should I focus when I'm trying to shoot one of those photos? Because on the photo of the tree, the tree looks really sharp. Yes. And the sky also looks really sharp. Great question. I'm sure that both parts of the image are going to have sharp. Phenomenal question. I'm so sorry that I forgot to mention focusing in this presentation. <laughs> Focusing is key. If you get somewhere and you get everything right and it's all out of focus, it's kind of pointless. So <laughs> the way you focus at night usually is you'll flip your camera into what's called live view mode if you have a DSLR or if you have a mirrorless camera, it's kind of the default. You want to use points of light that are super far away, whether it's a star in the sky or like a street light super far away and focus on that. Once you've focused on something far away, all the stars are like relative to you equally far away. So then your focus is set. So usually you'll like, I wish I could do a live demo of this, but it's really hard. But when it's dark, you flip your camera into manual focus, you'll have blurry points of light and you'll just play with the focus until those dots become smaller and smaller. And when you can get them as small as you can, that's when you've got focus on those stars, if that makes sense. You can do the same thing with the street light. Now to go back to the tree example, um, in this shot, you are correct, like the tree looks sharp and the Milky Way looks sharp. That's because with wide lenses, the depth of your focus is very deep, always. If you've ever looked at a GoPro video, everything's in focus, like the surfer and like the shark and then like the mountains, they're all, <laughs> they're all in focus. That's because GoPros are super, super wide and they have a small aperture. Something like this, I used a 14 millimeter lens. That's like really, really wide on a full frame camera. So both the tree and the Milky Way, even though the tree is a lot closer to me than the Milky Way is, it's still like, I don't know, 20, 30 feet away. And relative to the camera and its focal length, that counts as like infinity in this specific scenario. If you're using a more zoomed in lens, the tree would look very different than the stars. But with very wide lenses, if you're at infinity, most things will be in focus. The only time I'd say change that is when you're trying to take like a astrophotography portrait maybe. Yeah, so then you would focus on the person and the stars would appear as like nice diffuse orbs. Uh, bokeh, if anyone knows what that is. So yeah, cool, yes, now we're getting more. Okay, Alex, please. Oh. <laughs> almost, almost done. I'm moonlighting as a um, PhD student. <laughs> how has your um, academic studies influenced your astrophotography? Yes, uh, great question. So I, I actually look at wildfires for my research. So I'm out deep in the forest all the time, which is great. I get to sleep in my car. I love it. Uh, <laughs> and I get to be in dark places far away from city lights all the time. So I get exposed to astro way more than I would, I think, on a general basis. So I get to be out in dark places. And the more you are, the more things you'll see. Sometimes you see like a thunderstorm in the distance and there's lightning coming down and you can see the stars above it. And that's just like, poof, like you just have to spend a bunch of nights or be really lucky to see something like that. So yeah, I'd say because my studies uh, include tons of field work, I get to be outside all the time and if you have a camera with you, which I recommend you always do, you will see stuff eventually, and then you're able to capture it. It's just a question of being there at the right place at the right time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. There was others. Yes, you. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about your process. Like, how do you find the locations that you shoot at? I'm assuming it's very dark out. Do you go before when it's light? Well, first, first step, like you said, <laughs> finding the location. So I'll look at places that are dark. If I'm like going out and I'm like, I'm just going to do astrophotography. I'll look at places that are super dark and then going when it's daytime, there's a whole host of apps that you can use as well to kind of see where is the Milky Way going to be? Or like, where's this astronomical thing that I care about going to be? You can like just turn on your phone app 
point it at a scene, and it will kind of show you. I've never bought any of those apps. I'm sure they're great. Photo Pills is a very famous one. After some time, you kind of just get a feel for like north, south, east, west. You know that at certain time in the year, like I know that in July, the Milky Way is going to be like straight south. And so when I'm standing at a point during the day, whether it's on a hike in Yosemite or Bryce, I'd be like, all right, that's south. Like, how does my scene look? I actually kind of like it more from like, I don't know, 100 meters that way. So I'll like find some locations during the day uh, and, and see what it looks like. But oftentimes, I also just show up at night. There's nothing better than just like seeing what your scene is as it's going to be and then like working with what you have right there. But finding the, the dark location is a good first step. Yeah, and often I've found that it pushes me to go to places I haven't been before if I really want to get specific shots. Yeah. Yes? How much do you like to like check or deal with atmospheric exposure and what creates the shutter or something? It has never been an issue ever for anything I've done. I, if you are serious about deep sky, sure. Like, it's more a thing for like when you're really like zooming in and you're going to have to worry about like turbulence, but for wide stuff, I've never had an issue with like any sort of uh, atmospheric distortion. Haze is definitely an issue. Smoke is definitely an issue. Fog, clouds, all that stuff is very real. But atmospheric distortion is like deep. Yeah, There's, I wouldn't worry about it at any time soon. Yeah, yes? Where do you want to go next? Where do I want to go next? Uh, I actually have an answer to that. I have a really big exam coming up. Uh, and whether I pass or I fail, I'm going to need a break after it. Uh, so I really want to go to this thing here. Uh, I want to go, there's a volcano in Guatemala that is constantly erupting. And the eruptions often interact with the atmosphere and make like little lightning strikes at night. Uh, so it just looks kind of like, I don't know, looks like Mordor come to life. Yeah. So I would really like to go there uh, and take some night photography from like these viewpoints. Like some, if I, something I'd be very happy with something like that. So yeah, so that's where I'm thinking of going next. There's very cheap like uh, tour guides that will bring you up and yeah, it just seems like I've never been to Guatemala. So yeah, I'm thinking of going there. Um, yeah, great question. But locally, where I'd like to go next, uh, I do have this kind of vision. I'd really like to get a shot of like a lone oak tree on a grassy hill with like that golden grass that we get around here with the Milky Way over the ocean in the background. I've wanted to capture a shot like that for a long time. I'm going to need to do more looking at like Google Maps and Google Earth to, to figure out where the spot might be. A lot of private land in the US, so it's, it can be a bit tricky. Yeah. Yes? How do your like, parameters and considerations change when you're shooting on film? Great question. So film, does anyone shoot film in here? It's a bunch of cool, yeah, look at that. OK, <laughs> film is awesome. Film is great. We have two film shots on Astro here. Uh, I can pass them around. There you go. These are Northern Lights stuff. Uh, film is great in so many ways. One thing it's not as good at is capturing light when there's not a lot of it. Film is not as sensitive as modern digital sensors. I'll get this one going in the, in the back and then they can cross over here. Let's, or we'll start with you all the way. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, yeah, they're, they're all, yeah. <laughs> Just got them from Google, you know. <laughs> um, typical film that you can buy Film, okay, the interesting thing about film is that the ISO cannot be changed. So the film that you put in your camera is kind of like, the ISO is kind of set. You can do a little bit with it after. If you develop it yourself, you can let it develop longer. You can do what's called pushing film. And that's something I did with both the shots you see here. I needed to have a little bit more boost to it, so I developed them chemically a bit longer. But with film, you really, really have to maximize the amount of light that's coming in. It's more designed for just general daytime stuff. Like that, it just isn't ever going to be as sensitive as like a modern digital sensor. Um, so with film, 
I actually bought a camera for $10. The one that shot these images is a $10 plastic film camera. And the reason I got it was because it has an EF mount. Now the EF mount is a more modern lens mount. A lot of film cameras are kind of this era. You know, they come with like an old lens that that manufacturer has been out of business for, I don't know, 50 years. This is a Canon camera. They still make cameras and they still made lenses for EF mount. I mean, they're still in production today from some companies. So I was able to take one of my modern uh, digital lenses and because it has the same mount as this camera, just stick on this super bright lens onto this $10 camera. This lens is a lot more than $10, but <laughs> you get the idea. This lens lets in a ton of light. It's super sharp, it's, su it's super wide, and it's the one that made both of these photos that are getting passed around right now. So I put a high ISO film in. The highest ISO film you can typically buy nowadays is like 800 ISO film. If that's out of stock at your local film store, a lot of disposable cameras, the, you know, the ones that you could just like bring to a party and just like throw on the ground, whatever, they often have, <laughs> they often have 800 speed film inside. Yeah, like this one right here. We're not gonna throw it on the ground, can I just hold it up here? Stuff like this often has, this one might be 400 or 800, but it often has like pretty speedy, pretty high ISO film. So you can open one of those in complete darkness, roll the film back almost all the way, just keep a little bit, and then just, I don't have film in here, and then you stick it in your film camera, and then you go like that. Um, so yeah, film is great, and it's a fun technical challenge to use for astrophotography. It's also, in a way, like astrophotography, you can really get lost in the editing. There's so much you can do with the digital files, and sometimes it's like overwhelming. Film is a nice break from that. If you want to just like, how it is is, is what we're gonna get, film is a great option. I really like shooting film at night. Yes? that are 800, I mean, Portrait 800 is a classic. It's so versatile and I love it during the day as well. I haven't tried shooting Cinestill 800 at night, but that would be interesting to see how the halations react with the, with the stars. Um, and then, yeah, the kind of regular stock Fuji 800 or Kodak 800 that you can find in the disposable cameras. This one was made with disposable camera 800 from a Fuji disposable camera. Yeah, yeah, yes? Great question. I don't have Lightroom on this computer. Usually when I bring a raw file in, uh, I want to try and balance the white balance first. And so if you go into that first website that I recommended uh, from Ian Norman, really, really great dude. He has this whole like workflow on like how you can go about editing. Editing is very subjective. It's very taste dependent, you might like to edit one way. I used to like editing in a disgusting style, in my opinion. <laughs> like, what is that? What even, that's not real, like, ugh. Um, now I like to try and edit a bit more like neutrally. I really haven't changed the color around much. Uh, this is pretty much exactly what it is. I think I've maybe brought up the shadows a tiny bit in the foreground. And I've pulled the white slider, which is like almost like highlights, but a little bit more in the midtones. I've pulled that up a bit to bring the stars out just a little bit more. But I've really barely edited this. And oftentimes nowadays, my best astro shots are the ones that just look great. Like in camera, you're like, okay, this one's, this one's awesome. If you have to put a ton of work into it, you're probably better off like looking for good conditions and going again. So yeah. Yo, yes, okay, you, yeah, what's up? What were the general settings compared to how you can talk about most of the other photos to get star trails? Right, star trails. We'll pass this one around too. I'll just hold it up first. Uh, star trails are great. Um, to get star trails, there you have two options. You can either shoot and let the camera expose for way, way longer. This would be like, an hour long photo or more to get this. The second option that you have, and is the more common one nowadays, is to take many, many photos continuously, like a time lapse. So a time lapse is just photos taken one after the other and then assembled into a video afterwards. For this, I basically shot a time lapse 
And then there are different softwares you can use. The most common one is this free one called Starstacks. And when you just put in, you load into Starstacks all your photos from your time lapse. There might be two, three, four hundred of them. You put them in there, and it will just kind of like overlay all of them, it will stack them into a photo like this because the motion is naturally happening. So between each photo, the stars move like a tiny bit. And over time, that motion adds up and gives you these trails, which we'll now pass around. But yeah, star trails are actually really forgiving. You can do them even with a very like basic low-level camera because you're getting so much exposure time that even if you don't have a bright lens, once they're all sandwiched together, you won't have much noise left at all. Yeah. Yes? Great question. So will the trees, the question was, will the trees in the foreground change across all the shots? If my camera is super steady on a peak design tripod, of course, <laughs> <laughs> which it is. They're great tripods. Highly recommend them. They're on the wall. You guys can check them out. They didn't tell me to say that. They're not even here right now in the room with us. Um, if my camera is super steady, as it always is on a peak design tripod, uh, and the trees are not moving either, and neither are the mountains, nothing that is stationary should move throughout the time lapse. Now, if it's windy, yeah, the, the tree tops might like move a little bit, so they might end up being a little fuzzy in the final image. It's possible. There are other ways where you could also just like pick one image for your foreground, and then like, take out the other ones and then just mask in, but that, that's too in-depth. I don't like to get into the super heavy editing, but you could if you wanted to. But so, yeah, if it's super windy, your trees might be a little blurry, but if your camera isn't moving and neither are the trees, only the stars should be moving relative to you. The other reason people often do the time-lapse method as opposed to one super long thing, in your time-lapse, if a plane comes through in like one of the photos, you could just take that photo out and then you could still have your nice star trails without a plane going right through it. If you have like a one hour exposure and then a bunch of planes come through at different intervals, that's gonna be really painstaking to like go in and remove all those. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for coming back from the film camera, yeah. I wanted to know, like you say that you, ex uh, you develop, you yes. boost your film. I boost so my film, yeah. This is something that we can ask like, to the people who develop for us, so we have to do at home. That's film lab dependent. So if you just drop it off at like CVS, I don't know if they'll be able to do it. But if you have a like, local film lab around here that you have a good like, relationship with and they do it like, by hand or just like small batch, they will probably be able to do it. I can't say objectively because I develop my own film. So I don't actually know what the labs here do. I know that my old lab in Canada was able to push it for me if I wanted to. But developing at home can also save you a ton of money. That's why I do it. Uh, and it gives you a ton of creative control. So yeah, you can like let your film sit in the chemicals for longer. Uh, and, and then it, that will basically boost the exposure on it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if you're developing your own film, how do you calculate how long to push it for? That's great. So um, let's say film at a certain temperature. It's all temperature and time dependent, right? But let's say you know that your film usually takes like five minutes to develop the regular amount. Usually the box of chemicals that you get will have an instruction set on them that says if you want to push it by one stop, so that means double the kind of brightness, you need to do this extra amount of time. If you want to push it by two stops, you need this extra amount of time. It will usually give you the instructions for up to three stops. It's very rare to push more than that. But I mean, every time you go up, you're kind of like doubling, so it's already a lot brighter. So I usually just kind of like, I know when I'm shooting, and sometimes I'll have a film camera and a digital camera. And I'll be like, okay, on my digital camera, my ISO is 3,200, but my film that's in here is only 800. How many times do you have to multiply 800 to get to 3,200? I double it once, that's one stop. So I double it to 1,600, and then I double it again. So that's two stops. So I know now when I develop the film that I should push it by two stops, and I'll just leave it in, 
however much longer the box says that is. I hope that is a good answer. Yes? OK, cool. Yes, Allison. Great. Uh, at night, it's very different. During the day, I only use this now. This is my favorite camera of all time. I've been like posting about it nonstop. They don't sponsor me. I don't even know if it's possible for them to. If you're out there, someone at Rico, please. <laughs> this is my favorite daytime camera. At night, if I know I'm going to be shooting stars, um, I really like just this lens kind of does almost anything I need it to pretty wide. It's a 20 millimeter. It's very bright, f1.4, so it lets in a ton of light. And I can adapt it onto whichever camera I want. My new favorite camera for shooting stars, and this is not like go out and buy this, don't. <laughs> this is, but the one that I'm using to film right now, my lovely assistant Catherine, thank you so much for coming with me today. Uh, that Round of applause for Catherine, guys. She's been an absolute hero. Uh, that's an a7C2. I didn't think there'd be that much of a difference versus my like Canon R6. There is. There's way more dynamic range in the files at night, which basically means I can play with the shadows and the highlights a lot more uh, on the files. But I don't want to say like buy this, buy that. Any camera where you can control the settings and stick a bright lens onto it, you'll be able to get results. And this shouldn't be something that is like cost prohibitive to get into in the first place. I remember my first lens was like a $300 used 24 millimeter f1.4. It was plenty bright and I stuck that on my T2i and eventually I changed the T2i to like a full frame and so I had a wider field of view. Um, but yeah, I'm really winding around your answer because I don't want to tell people like just buy this, just buy that and then it might be too expensive for them. Anything you have is good enough to start with. I just, I really like this 20 millimeter lens but there's plenty of good options out there. Yeah. And I can, I can give like, uh, Ian Norman on his website has a list of like every lens and how bright it is and like what the used cost is and so on. So I can link that in the uh, event description or like the live video recording afterwards. Yeah. Yes, Allie. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a great question. That would be really different during the day. Um, at night, something like lightning happens really quickly. So even if it's a long exposure, the lightning will still look sharp because it's like instantaneous. If the lightning was like then like moving, <laughs> doing all sorts of stuff, it would look crazy. But lightning specifically is one of those things that will always look kind of sharp, just like a flash. Um, so at night, it's rare that I'm shooting, I'm like changing the shutter speed much. One of the only cases where I could think of it, it is more like northern light stuff because those are moving quickly. Sometimes a consideration I take is when I'm taking a photo of a person with the stars in the background. If I want the person to like show up and be like crisp and like sharp, they can't move for whatever my exposure time is. So when I'm specifically shooting a person, I might, you know, kind of bend the rules a bit, boost the ISO more and shorten the shutter speed. So I, instead of trying to stand like rock still for like 30 seconds, someone can just try and like hold still for like five. My ultimate image quality won't be quite as good, but like it might work better for getting the person sharp or like if they're trying to hold like a funny pose or something. Yeah. Yeah. Catherine. A question from Instagram. Oh, what? Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> Who who is asking that? Uh, John Scramble, Canadian. Wow, uh, <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's amazing. I'm Canadian, by the way. The happy happy to report. Yes, yes. Um, have I tried shooting planets? Uh, what was the other stuff? Starlink trains. Yes to one of those, no to the other. So I've tried shooting meteor showers. Meteor showers are great. They happen fairly regularly. Uh, usually around like August 12th to the 15th, you'll have the Perseids. That's the most famous one. 
every year it happens because we go through, we, we're going around the sun, by the way. I don't know if <laughs> that's been established. <laughs> And every time we get to a specific kind of spot in our solar system, we go through a belt of like rocks and stuff. And so when that happens, a lot of these rocks get pulled into our gravitational field, they fall to Earth and they burn up in the atmosphere and you see all these little shooting stars. And sure, shooting stars happen on any given night. I guarantee you, if you go and just look at the same like spot in the sky for a while, you will see a shooting star. I say you can look at any spot for, I would bet money that you could look at any spot for 45 minutes and guarantee that you will see at least one shooting star during that time. They happen a lot more than we think, we're just never looking. We're always in the city and you can't really see them here. When you go during the Perseids, you might see them every minute, every 30 seconds at some of the peaks. Sometimes one comes and like three come right after. It's really exciting and if you do a time lapse during that, You'll be able to capture a bunch of them and then people do these composite images where they combine every shot they took from like the same, let's say they're on a stable tripod, like the Peak Design one, doesn't move. <laughs> <laughs> they combine all the shots that they've taken from that exact viewpoint and merge them and so that you get like a shot that has like 30, 40, 50 shooting stars in it. It looks pretty cool. I haven't tried to do that kind of processing. As for like planets and Starlink, Planets, you have to be really zoomed in. I've tried to shoot Jupiter and Saturn when there was the Great Conjunction. I have a video on my YouTube about it. It's super bad. Don't look at it. Um, John is the only one that's allowed to look at it. He's, he's allowed. Uh, and yeah, so I've tried doing a bit of that, but it was more just like trying to film them line up. I wasn't really in it for the image quality. Planets, usually you have to be more with like a telescope. And I personally find that it's a ton of work for something that then ends up looking like a kind of colorful blob. I hate, if I've offended a whole bunch of people out on the internet, I'm sorry. It's just, it's not where my heart is. I, I care more about like the scenes, the landscape, and sometimes some deep sky stuff like Andromeda and Orion, but planets are not really my thing. Starlink shows up in your shots a lot, whether you want it or not now. Um, and yeah, sometimes I just have to try and remove it. I've never intentionally tried to shoot just Starlink though. Yeah, can't believe someone's watching on Instagram. That's great. <laughs> uh, yes, Dan, what's up? Uh, what other types of photography do you like to do? Like, what else do you like to shoot? Yes. And where can I and other people find more of your photos? Well, it's funny that you say that, Dan, because I have a box with cards for all of you with my website. We can pass it around. Take one, pass it on. Uh, I have a website where you can see some of my like landscape work as well. I do sometimes shoot not just at night. I shoot in the day too. Uh, it's crazy, I know. I do some wildlife stuff. Recently, I've been getting a lot more into like portraiture, humans, architecture. I have some shots here of that. We also have a bunch of, we have this large print here, if anyone's interested. We have two slightly smaller ones there. And then we have a bunch of loose ones as well. Obviously, these ones are less expensive. The loose ones are less expensive than the big one and so on. But if anyone's interested, once this all like ends, we can all socialize and come up and we can chat and stuff. Um, but yeah, my website, I have my Instagram. It's all on the cards, pass them around. Uh, thank you for that shameless plug, I appreciate it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, yes, in the back. Oh my God. Oh, there's a lot. Uh, there's a lot and I don't, I, this is like the don't try this at home section. <laughs> You're like, don't do this, I don't recommend this. Um, man, that's, okay. Uh, wow, I could, I could talk about each, like I'd say half of these were all like insane like sends. Um, this one, for example, they, oh, I'll put it up on the screen, actually. La, 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 la. This one here, I, this is the bristlecone pines. Like I said, they only grow at like really high elevation. Yeah. So I was driving up there, and the road, the pavement ends, so it becomes this like gravel road. Fine, normal enough. It becomes the worst washboard like texture I've ever seen. I was trying every speed to try and like negate it. My car was like being shaken apart. 
to the point that my radiator just like unhooked and then exploded. And I was like, holy shit. And so then I like managed to just like, like, I mean, the temperature gauge like shot up like crazy. I was there, I had no signal. I was like, okay, 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 okay. what am I gonna do here? I was like way past where the cars normally come. I was like, okay, I'll probably spend one night here. The only thing was I had to meet a friend at the bottom of the mountain, but I couldn't reach them. So I was like, they're gonna hate me right now. Um, so stayed there for a while, opened the hood, actually pulled out, you know the user manual that's like in your club? <laughs> Turns out that's really useful. Uh, and what I was trying to figure out without internet was I had a ton of water in my car and I was like, the hose is like cracked and broken. Can I just continuously pour water into my radiator to cool it down? Turns out that in a pinch, you can. If you're ever out there and your radiator is blown and it's like leaking, you can pour water into it, drive a bit, pour more water into it, drive a bit. And that's basically what I did until I got down again. Uh, this wasn't as far down as I was meant to go. I still took a stop, left my car. I was like, I will drive to you, my friend. But first, I need to go take this shot. And so I did. Uh, and then I made my way down to my friend. So that one was one crazy one. Um, let's see some other ones. This one was kind of whack. This was like, you really have to want it. Um, I had just done one of the longest hikes of my life in a single day. We had gone up to the highest mountain in Oman. I grew up in the Middle East, so this was not like some fancy trip. This is like weekend camping. And uh, I, it was super hot that day. It was way too hot to be hiking. And we hiked like 30 miles round trip with maybe 6,000 feet of gain. And so then 6,000 feet back. So I was like shot. I was completely exhausted. Um, and to the point that like when we were coming back into camp, like my leg... <laughs> I genuinely was like, I think I've maybe like torn some like tendons or something. Like it, it hurt just to like, I couldn't not sit like by the end. It was painful. Every step was pain. I've never like walked that far before in one go. And so it was daytime and I was like, I'm going to have, I was looking at the conditions. It was a new moon. I was like, I'm going to have some of the coolest like conditions ever tonight. And it was, I was like, we got back at like 6 PM and I was like, I really need to like take Astro shots. Like, but you know, I was completely dead. I went to bed and miraculously, somehow by like 1 a.m. when I woke up, I had set my alarm for that. My legs felt so much better. I don't know how. I just like, my friends were like, are you still gonna go? I was like, dude, look outside. Like, it's amazing. And so yeah, I didn't walk like the full 30 miles back. I only walked like a couple to like this point that I had seen on the hike down. And uh, yeah, got this really cool like dust layer where all the light pollution is like bouncing off the, the particulate matter in the, in the atmosphere there. Yeah, yeah, so this is all just kind of like a little like kind of light dust cloud floating there. And then above it is like the more clear portion with less dust and that's why you see the Milky Way come through a bit more clearly. And I really liked like the, the silhouette of the trees in the foreground. It, I don't know, I just, and I, I went back years later and it didn't look the same anymore. Some of the trees had grown weird, some of them had been cut, so. Yeah, I was, I'm, this one is also a crazy one. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I don't know what else, what other images do I have in here? I mean, I froze my butt off for like all three of these completely. I was so cold, but worth, you know? <laughs> uh, this one too, this is at super high altitude. This is like 14,000 feet. I could not sleep that entire night, but it was worth it for me. I'm not saying go do it, but like, I really like this stuff. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm legally not responsible for any. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Any other questions? If not, we could just like socialize. You guys should all meet one another. You're all into photography. Thank you so. Oh, sorry. We got one more. What's up? <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just mostly all your pictures that you take uh, were in America or in Canada? No, this, so this is in Switzerland. Uh, this one's in Iceland. These three are in Iceland, sorry. This one's in Oman. Uh, this one's in California. I didn't take that one. Uh, let's see what's in the other direction. These two I got in Oman as well, but you could get them from anywhere, really. That's you know location agnostic there. That's in Dubai. That's in Vancouver, BC. Uh, and that's in Switzerland. Yeah. And I got more on the way. Happy to tell you where any of the photos come from. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes. No comment pictures? No what, sir? 
I, I do, yes. I do have, uh, my phone is live streaming right now. Uh, have I posted it anywhere? Who have I sent it to? I, well, I'm trying to think of, did I send you? I sent one to, oh, I sent one to Sebas. Okay. I, don't look at the text, guys, all right? <laughs> Just give me a second here. also not legally responsible. Yeah, they, this isn't even my computer. I don't even know. I, oh, it's, it's this video here. Give me a second. I don't know what that image is. Don't look. Don't look. Uh, it's very low resolution. Okay, it's, it's very low resolution. Gear doesn't matter, guys. No. But I, 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 so I did like a time lapse of me trying to like catch the comet the other night. It looks, it looks good. Like I captured it with a camera. It's just, it wasn't on this computer. It's on the other one that's live streaming right now. What, what's up? Do it again. Do it again? Okay. Whoa. 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 Yeah, I don't know why it's showing up in such low res, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be ready to pause that now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, you get the idea. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, Comet is cool. It's fading every day. If you get the chance, you probably won't see it with the naked eye anymore, but go out there, do a long exposure with your phone or your camera. You might still see it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. <laughs> Anything else? We good? Let's all socialize. Thank you so much for coming. It's been a pleasure. This has genuinely been like a, a dream. So yeah, thank you.